Hey guys, it's been a great family camp. Um, it's right away, came into this tent and it was like, this is bigger. Okay? That is a great, that's a great, great thing. And uh, just thankful for family camp. I've, I've actually been blessed to be to every, at every single family camp there's ever been. And I think about 47 years of family camps. And brother, if you study a little bit of history, oftentimes 47 years down the road, there's a lot of keeping in. There's a lot of shifting. There's a lot of getting soft. And I appreciate this congregation, not Montana Family Camp tonight, I say this congregation for standing firm on the truth, for the faithfulness over the years. Should I sing while I'm doing this? Or? Um, tremendous blessing in my life. Help me, has helped me, helped my family. The things that are important to keep the kingdom focus and to know that there are brethren in the world who are going through the same things and staying faithful. And I just am really, really appreciative to you guys uh, for that, that commitment to the truth. And I'll just say, you know, one other thing. That there are sometimes some difficult times in our lives. And there's some challenges sometimes. And, and the devil comes and maybe even sometimes he gets his hooks into you a little bit. I want to encourage you, you never, ever, ever compromise on the truth. You stand in the truth, and Jesus Christ will pull you out and up to overcome. But if you compromise on the truth, man, it's, it's tough to come back from that. And so I just want to encourage you guys to uh, stay on that. Luke chapter 4, really thankful for Marshall's message. It's actually very similar in, in many ways, totally different set of... Uh, of Old Testament uh, foreshadows, but very similar in, in the message. And I just, you know, for, for a pause for a second before I launch into mine, guys, a clean conscience, the nature of it, what Marshall did a beautiful job laying out the scriptures on that. And you cannot see this with your physical eye. So you have to be able to see it with your spiritual eye. And deeper than that, I'm going to say, you have to know what Jesus has done for us it's an interesting thing because to be able to have a clean conscience where you have no conscience, no consciousness of sins, you have to fight through it logically and consciously recognize that the blood that was shed on our behalf and that when we contacted that blood in immersion, we have been totally 100% forgiven. You have to be able to think through that logically and consciously in order to be able to have that clean conscience. Guys, God did a lot. I don't know if you've, the, one of the takeaways I've got from this family camp so far is, man, he had this thing laid in there early on, didn't he? It's laid in there from the beginning of where, I mean, God knew where he was going all along with this thing. It's been, been great to see that. Uh, Luke chapter 4, I want to start in verse 14. Luke 4, verse 14. And Jesus returned to Galilee in the power of the Spirit. And news about him spread through all the surrounding district. And he began teaching in their synagogues and was praised by all. And he came to Nazareth where he had been brought up. And as was his custom, he entered the synagogue on the Sabbath and stood up to read. And the book of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him. And he opened the book and found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set free those who are downtrodden, to proclaim the favorable year of the Lord. And he closed the book and gave it back to the attendant and sat down. And the eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed upon him. And he began to say to them, Today, this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we praise your glorious name. Lord, your, your wisdom, the eternal wisdom that we see revealed in the pages of your word. Your plan, Lord, to bring about 
true freedom to your people. How blessed we are, Lord, to be counted among those who are of your family. I ask, Lord, that you be with me tonight as I preach, that it would be the truth of your word, that I would communicate clearly, and that each of us would really consider both slavery to sin and what that means, and the freedom and what that means. We're so thankful for what you've done for us. So in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You know, one thing about it, Jesus knew his Old Testament. I mean, this, in uh, Luke chapter 4, where I started, Jesus had just been out there in the wilderness being tempted by the devil. And we know the way Jesus came back with him was quoting scripture. And Jesus, in the book of Deuteronomy, right? And just a curiosity, how many of you guys have memorized the book of Deuteronomy? I've memorized some books of the Bible. Just pulling it out there. Okay, he, the book, the scroll of Isaiah, the prophet Isaiah is handed to him. And we got these nice things, chapters, books, and, and, and within our books we have chapters, right? So Jesus got the scroll of Isaiah, and uh, he opens the book and he finds the place where this is written. Because Jesus knew his Old Testament. Now, this isn't, Isaiah isn't the Torah. Okay? It is interesting to me, a, a side note, uh, the Messianic, well, I'll, I'll just step back. The Jews themselves, they only claim the Torah, right, as the Word of God. Because some of the prophecies on Isaiah and stuff are so straightforward. How do you miss Jesus? But after this weekend, how do you even claim the Torah? Those guys are going to have to throw that thing away, too. It's just so clear, actually, all of it, all that points to Jesus. But this, this what Jesus is, is reading from here comes from our Isaiah chapter 61. But Isaiah himself, he, through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, as he was foretelling the coming of Jesus Christ and what he was going to do, he actually was speaking of something from the Torah. This message is a message of freedom. I don't know the way all of you guys are wired, but I've always cared about freedom. I, I will watch the, I almost said the passion of the Christ, that's, <laughs> that's good too, but uh, um, William Wallace, oh, Braveheart, right? And I just like, freedom, yes, let's go. You know, and I, I wanna become a, a tax protester and uh, you know, a, a guy that's a little better with guns than I am, because I'm not good with them, but I like my buddies that are. I want to, hey, let's go, let's take this on. That, that's, I think Mike Ferguson hit that this morning. That's not what this is about. But freedom burns inside of me. I don't, I don't like slavery, the concept of that. I don't like it at a personal level. I don't like what I see as being done in this country and across the world, global slaves. I don't like that. So freedom burns in me. And when Jesus is talking here, he is bringing up from Isaiah and from the Torah, we'll get to in a second, the idea of true freedom that is promised. Jesus says, from, from this Isaiah passage, he says he anointed me to preach the gospel, to preach the gospel to the poor, to proclaim release to the captives, to set free those who are downtrodden to proclaim the favorable year of the Lord. And then Jesus said, this passage is fulfilled in him. So what is this, what is this favorable year of the Lord? What is the year of the Lord's favor? It comes from Leviticus chapter 25, and we'll be going there shortly. You guys can turn there now if you want. That, that year is known as the year of Jubilee. The favorable year of the Lord. The year of the Lord's favor. And uh, in, in Leviticus chapter 25, I would encourage you, you know, some of... I, I need to repent a little bit. And uh, one of those areas is sometimes the Old Testament, and I know Mr. Simpson gets disappointed in me in this, Sometimes I don't know my Old Testament as well as I should. 
And uh, some of the brethren will ask me a question sometimes from the Old Testament. I say, hey, go out. That's a great question for Kevin. Go ask him. Man, that burns him up. Okay? I, I enjoy doing it, so I'm not going to quit even as I get to know my Old Testament better. I, hey, go, go ask Kevin Simpson. Um, but I, I admit, guys, when I first started reading my Bible, I just, as a teenager, really trying to, to be consistent about it, I'd get through Genesis, no problem. Exodus, no problem. And Leviticus <laughs> took me out a bunch of times. I, and everyone, I, I'm sorry, Kevin, it's every once in a while, I just still go into speed reading mode in some of these passages. And, and uh, I will encourage you, though, Go back. I'm not going to read all of Leviticus chapter 25 tonight, but I'll encourage you to go back and read the entire chapter. The first part of this chapter is about Sabbath years. So, of course, we know there's a Sabbath, and that was um, recognized every seventh day of the week, right? Saturday. And then there is the Sabbath year. Every seventh year, the land was to have a rest. And, well, well I'm going to pick it up. In uh, following that, then we learn a little bit about the year of Jubilee. Leviticus chapter 25, let's start in verse 8. Leviticus 25, verse 8. You are also to count off seven Sabbaths of years for yourself. Seven times seven years. So that you have the time of the seven Sabbaths of years, namely 49 years. You shall then sound a ram's horn abroad on the tenth day of the seventh month. On the day of atonement... You, just, you shall sound a horn all through your land. You shall thus consecrate the 50th year and proclaim a release through the land to all its inhabitants. It shall be a jubilee for you, and each of you shall return to his own property, and each of you shall return to his family. You shall have the 50th year as a jubilee. You shall not sow, nor reap its aftergrowth, nor, get, nor gather in from its untrimmed vines. For it is a jubilee, it shall be holy to you. You shall eat its crops out of the field. On this year of Jubilee, each of you shall return to his own property. Hey, that's kind of a summary of what he's going to go into. I want to read just a couple other really short passages from this chapter. Jump down with me to verse 25. Leviticus 25, verse 25. If a fellow countryman of yours becomes so poor, he has to sell part of his property, then his nearest kinsman is to come and buy back what his relative has sold. Or in case a man has no kinsman, but so recovers his means as to find sufficient for its redemption, then he shall calculate the years since its sale and refund the balance to the man whom he sold it, and so return to his property. But if he has not found sufficient means to get it back for himself, then what he has sold shall remain in the hand of its purchaser until the year of Jubilee. But at the Jubilee it shall revert that he may return to its, his property. Then verses 39 through 42. And if a countryman of yours becomes so poor with regard to you, that he sells himself to you, you shall not subject him to a slave's service. He shall be with you as a hired man, as if he were a sojourner with you, until the year of Jubilee. He shall then go out from you, he and his sons with him, and shall go back to his family, that he may return to the property of his forefathers. For they are my servants whom I brought out from the land of Egypt. They are not to be sold in a slave sale. And then verses 54 and 55. Even if he is not redeemed by these means, he shall still go out, in the year of Jubilee, he and his sons with him, for the sons of Israel are my servants. They are my servants whom I brought out from the land of Egypt. I am the Lord your God. So let's just talk about a, a few quick key points here. Verse 10, there's going to be release, right? Uh, a release to the land to all of its, its inhabitants. That sounds like Isaiah, what Jesus read in Luke chapter 4. A release, proclaim release. Uh, the pro in reference to property, okay? you get to return to your property. Guys, I'm not preaching on that tonight. That's a whole message in and of itself. We have a land, don't we, that's been given to us, that's ours, our inheritance. The promised land, the church, the kingdom. It's a great message. That's been given to us uh, through this year of Jubilee. The second part of it is in, in reference to personal debt. Okay? Basically, you're a slave. Okay? You're a servant. And in the year of Jubilee, you get to return to your family. 
And that's, that's what I'm going to focus in on tonight. Nobody could be a perpetual slave. God had this set up this way that nobody could be a perpetual slave to somebody because his people were his servants. Not, not a bad system. So God made provisions for when people became so poor. This is, we know it as the year of Jubilee. Every 50th year. Now, as a side note, I just want to ask you a question. How did the nation of Israel do on keeping the Sabbath years? You know, every seventh year, it's supposed to be a Sabbath year. How'd they do on keeping that? Terrible. That's one of the reasons they were in captivity for 70 years, right? Book of Jeremiah lets us know it's going to be 70 years. I Right now, I think it's 2 Chronicles, tells us that they were going to be captive through that period of time until the land got its rest, that they should have been keeping every seventh year. Okay? So that's a lot of years. They didn't keep it, guys. Seventy years was required for that. So over a period of what? Seventy times seven. Four hundred and ninety. Some of us have been watching VeggieTales or remember it. Ah. Uh, So, a lot of years that they weren't keeping that. So, if they weren't keeping those, how do you think they were doing on keeping the year of Jubilee? Probably not so well either. Guys, this year of Jubilee really was was only going to be carried out in the New Covenant. I want to talk about this a little bit tonight because what we're talking about is spiritual debt and spiritual freedom. It's... It's interesting because I have a little, as much as I like to say that freedom burns in me, I have a little bit of a difficult time honestly comprehending what it is to be somebody's slave. We still have it really good in America. There are opportunities that are still available for us to go and work hard and actually make some money and have some independence in the physical realm. But th- tonight as I, as I preach this, I, I want to try to communicate the idea of what it means to be a slave so that we can understand also what it means to really be free. You know, what does Proverbs chapter 22, verse 7 say about the principle of the borrower and the lender? The borrower is a slave to the lender. When you go in debt, you're a slave to that person that you borrowed from until it's paid back. Jesus said in John chapter 8, verse 34, he says, I say to you, everyone who commits sin is a slave of sin. So let's talk about slavery to sin a little bit, the debt of sin. Let's go back real quickly. Adam and Eve. After Adam and Eve sinned, after they eat the forbidden fruit, what's the first thing they did? Somebody said clothed themselves. First thing they did was they hid. They understood. They felt that separation from God, and the first thing they did is they went into hiding from Him. Now later, He booted them out of the garden, but they... They felt that separation first, and they hid themselves from him. Because any of us accountable, it's reached the point of accountability in our lives. We have a spiritual maturity to be able to be, you know, and and I'll just say an adult level maturity. Let's just say that. We know what sin does. What Marsh, beautiful example. That's the pits, man. It, It just... Sin starts banging away in here. The conscience starts bothering you. Okay, what do we do? Well, most people find a way. They just shove it to the back, shove it to the back, shove it to the back. The whole, we have a whole world that's trying to quiet that noise. And makes you look up to him. <laughs> and it's very, very serious. In the hearts and minds of Adam and Eve, it was interesting when Jerry was preaching, he talked about, you know, the.
How long, like, got that resolved? And so, generational, we see it pass, on, pass down and pass down to where, by the time of the flood, the heart of man is on evil continually. Yeah, we got, we got a problem in our society. The heart of man is on evil continually. People are so I don't know what people feel anymore inside. One of our responsibilities, I think somebody forget who, who preached this, all runs together, but one of the purposes of the law and becoming a tutor to lead us to Christ is to point out to people the problem of sin. You ever Bible study with people? It's, it was interesting to me. Uh, Julie and I had a study with a, a gal a few years back, and uh, we were talking about sin, and she's like, I, I, I don't think I sin. You know, and, and she was ser- sincere about that. She felt right, her relationship with God. In the meantime, she's living with a guy without being married. So I said, well, let's just go to Galatians chapter 5 and let's talk about, you know, the scripture gives some lists of what some of these sins are. The very first one that shows up. But you have to point that out to people. The law does point out the problem of sin. It will nail you to the wall. That's its purpose. The flood was there to bring up with that the, the law of the conscience that was there. Then the flood brings about God's judgment to drive that home. Hey, this is a problem. Feel it. Then the law that was given on Sinai that we heard about, okay, that was written on stone. Jeff Hustler hit that pretty hard. All of that is laid in there so that we know the problem that we are in. Now, I still sometimes have a hard time understanding what it is to be a slave. A few years back, I read a book called 12 Years a Slave. My last trip to the Philippines, uh, Steve Doty, how do you say that? Those those long flights, you say, they just start driving you so insane, you just want to eat eat like the back of your seat. I mean, it just starts driving you crazy. You're looking for anything to do. So I I saw that movie, I was like, hey, I'm going to watch that movie, 12 Years a Slave. As a side note, I know many of you guys over the years have been very faithful and praying for the Philippines and supporting them financially in, in many ways. Um, continue to pray for them. There's some, there were some great things on that trip. Many of the preachers, some of you guys remember, probably these, some of you remember some of the guys, Dante and Ramel, um, Danny, Monroe. Those guys, we, we've got to go and have preachers meetings and just start really trying to, the, the work that my dad has done, getting those guys started. We've been able to follow up with and start, hey, the necessity of personal evangelism and actually taking some of the tools and getting out there and not just inviting people to church. It's been a great thing, hasn't it, Mikel? It, it, it really has. And then you know, we got some started translation, um, which they're finding is more difficult than they thought it was going to be. Translate uh, some of the PowerPoints, uh, studies that they have of the booklets, and then, Lord willing, that's going to lead to um, translation of the booklets themselves in Tagalog and Ilocano, and then just in Manila, we've started something from scratch. Jeff's uh, organization, Bird of Prey, has gotten us over there, and uh, we started some stuff from scratch, and this, when we were there, we had 12 people in assembly in Manila. Manila's a city of 35 million people, roughly. Guys, they need the truth. Okay. So, we just pray for that. We got work to do, but anyways, that's, uh, where was that? 12 years of slave. So I was watching this hey, on, on the trip. And uh, this, the book was written by a guy named Solomon Northup in 1853, shortly after he regained his freedom, like within a year after he had regained his freedom. Now, this guy was born free. He was a man, he was a black man, born free. But his, his wife and, and children actually uh, had to leave for a little bit. And while they were gone... He got duped. He got tricked. He, some people offered him, hey, we'll, we'll pay you this money to come. And basically, uh, I think he was an excellent violin player. And you come and be with us in our music, and we'll pay you this money. And they go, and they treat him to a really nice dinner, have him get him a few drinks, and they drug him in those drinks. And the guy wakes up. And when he wakes up, 
This guy goes to dinner free. When he wakes up, his arms are in chains. It's run through. His legs are chained to the ground. And you start seeing this agony in this guy. All of his, his free papers, because he had to have papers to show he was a free black man, they're, they're gone. He just, everything he can, shaking that and screaming and trying, because he, you know what that means. How are you going to prove that you're free? The terror, the horror, and the things that transpired thereafter. He knew what it meant. He gets sold later in a slave auction, then gets sold to some different masters. Along the way, he's mistreated, he's whipped, he's beat, etc. A few times during that, he, he tries for freedom, and, and his plans don't work out. Some people they think are maybe going to help him, turn around, turn him in, betray him, etc. And so, beaten even worse. Now, can you guys see a little spiritual analogy here? Yeah, we, we were actually born free. Rousseau got that right. Man is born free, yet everywhere is in chains. The problem with Rousseau is he thought the, the system's the problem, right? We just fix the system. And that's the world's solution. Hey, if we, if we educate people, give people education for, what kind of education are we giving them, Jerry? An education of the truth is going to, but, you know, it's, it's a fictional education. It's not, but the education Pumping money into that is never going to solve the problem of looking around and seeing though man is born free everywhere he is in chains. It's a spiritual problem. It's a spiritual slavery. And the only way that we can be set free is through the gospel. The problem is sin. And every one of us, if we think about it, we were duped. The scriptures talks about Satan taking us captive. We were taken captive through the lusts of deceit. We were deceived in that. And then those passing pleasures of sin became chains. Chains that you cannot get out of by yourself. Held captive by Satan to do as well. I don't know everybody's personality in here, but I, there's a part of me I really don't like when somebody else tells me what I have to do. I just don't like that. I do not like to be a slave to Satan where he tells you what you have to do. You know, I used to play a game with my kids when they were young, and I had fun with it. And uh, they had varying degrees of fun with it. It was really fun for me. But I'd, I'd go and I'd trap them. I'd get down on the ground with them, and I'd come and I'd trap them, and I'd basically start, you know, where they were feeling like they were suffocating okay, from me being over the top of them. And they start out laughing, and then pretty soon, like, ah, and then, mom, mom, mom. I, I enjoyed playing that game with them. And then mom would come, and, you know, I'd, I'd let them go. And hey, Guys with Satan, that's no game. Satan takes you down, and he traps you. He beats you. You want to get up? He just beats you back down. You try again, beats you back down. Actually, another movie I watched was Ben-Hur. Those was the two movies I watched. Actually, I also watched Free Solo. I watched three. Steve Doty's recommendation. It was good. Uh, but, you know, Ben-Hur, after a while, you know what you do when you're a slave like that? You just lay low and don't resist. Because you get tired of getting kicked down and beat up over and over and over again. And you know what's really interesting, guys? The world, hey, there are certain sins that the world can overcome. Hey, I went to a 12-step program, and I overcame alcohol. And now what are you? 
And you sold to another master. Another sin's got you. Maybe it's just being a dry drunk. So you cannot overcome sin on your own. It's trapped. Beat down. Satan crushes any attempt at uprising. Okay, well, I think, again, anybody that's honest, if you felt it, you bend there, face down on the floor, tired of ge- being beat up on by the devil. Do you know, in this movie, the saddest scene of all to me, there's a point. Solomon Northup, was, he is, by all accounts, he is a nice guy. He was a good guy. He was friendly to his fellow slaves. And there's this part where his master actually makes him take the whip and beat one of his fellow slaves. The reality, guys, of sin in our lives is it hurts people we love. Lots of times we take others down with us and we hurt them along the way. That's a problem. Sin always messes things up. Romans 6.21. Romans 6.21. Therefore, what benefit were you then deriving from the things of which you are now ashamed for the outcome of those things is death. We've all experienced it, and we've all, it, and we look out, and the world is filled with death. Our family, outside of Christ, is filled with death. We've been there. Maybe some of us are there right now, filled with death. Now, in the movie, finally, Solomon Northup, he was able to, to get word to his family. Uh, and some other connections, and somebody showed up. Somebody official showed up with papers showing that he was a free man. Didn't Jesus come, guys, to proclaim release, to bring release to the captives? Jesus came to bring us freedom. What Marshall talked about beautifully, the, the, what he paid for with his own blood. It's a little different okay, than, the, than the story because Jesus purchased our freedom for us. He bought this hey, with his own blood. Jesus bound the strong man who held us as his property, right? I, I love that one. I'm not going to go into that too much tonight, but he binds the strong man and plunders his house. He releases that property that the strong man has held. The papers of freedom is just Marshall did a beautiful job of laying out what the scripture says about immersion. And I just encourage you guys, like, you got to stand firm on that. A, it's, it's amazing how much we have to fight it. But just from what we've seen, just from the Old Testament, this weekend, would you, wouldn't you be surprised if it wasn't a part of God's plan of salvation? So, so stand firm on that. But we know those papers of freedom are given us in our immersion into Jesus Christ. Romans chapter 6, verse 7. Um, just lost it. For he who has died is freed from sin. Now, here's the part I want to get to as we're, as we're getting to the end. An interesting thing. When the man came with the papers, the papers of freedom to set Solomon North up free to, to show, do you think that master wanted to let him go? It's like, hey, get back here. I don't remember what name he was calling him. He didn't go by the name Solomon in that. There's a whole message and identity on that. won't preach that. But that master didn't want to let him go. Calling him back. Hey, you're mine. You're mine. Because sin doesn't want to let us go. Satan doesn't want to let us go either. And some of us are still obeying our old master. Some of us who are in Christ Jesus, we're still listening to that old master. Romans chapter 6, let's turn there. Verses 16 through 19. 
Romans 6, 16 through 19. Do you not know that when you present yourselves to someone as slaves for obedience, you are slaves of the one whom you obey, either of sin resulting in death, of obedience resulting in righteousness? But thanks be to God that though you were slaves of sin, you became obedient from the heart to that form of teaching to which you were committed, and having become freed from sin, and having been freed from sin, you became slaves of righteousness. I'm speaking in human terms because of the weakness of your flesh. For just as you presented your members as slaves to impurity and to lawlessness, resulting in further lawlessness, so now present your members as slaves to righteousness, resulting in sanctification. Because why would we still obey our old master? I mean, just go, go back to the, the, the story of Solomon Northup for a second. Why would, if... When the man comes with his papers that show his freedom, why would he listen to the old master? He didn't, by the way. But why, what, under what conditions would you do that? The only one I can think of is you don't really believe that you've been set free. That's why the message that Marshall just preached is so important. We have to know. Satan ain't going to quit. He's still going to come after you. He's going to still call you by your old name. He's going to want you to obey him. You have to know you've been set free. You know, it, our, to steal a phrase from Steve Doty, our, our faith picture has to catch up to the spiritual reality. we got to see what God has done for us. You know, a side note, it made me think of Matthew chapter 18 in a different way than I ever thought of that before. Matthew, it's just a, the main point of Matthew 18 I've always got, but I just thought, you know, in Matthew 18, the guy's set free, right? I mean, this debt, he could never pay back. And then he goes out and finds a fellow slave who owes him a little bit of money, begins, you know, seizes him, begins to choke him, pay back what you owe, right? And he won't, even when the man says, hey, just please, I'll repay you everything. Same thing, he, no way, man. You pay back what you... Why would the guy do that? To his what? It, rem, it made me think of beating the fellow slave. Why would you do that? The only thing I... If you don't realize, you yourself have been set free. When that guy, just a slave's wages, he, gonna work, he can't even pay the interest on that debt. That's been forgiven him. He doesn't need the money from the other guy anymore. What is there he needs that for? Brother, we got to, so we quit in any form, beating our, our fellow slaves, if you will. We got to believe and recognize what God has done for us. Jesus came with our papers of freedom. We need to follow him. Got to walk with him. The spiritual realm is complicated. What Romans 6 here is talking about is habits. What our habits are. Who we really obey. And, and we know real change, real change can't take place without a change in thinking, which then results in a change in behavior. Those habits got to start changing, become habits of righteousness. Yeah, there's a really good book I could suggest, you might read on that, called Cleansing the Inside of the Cup by a man named Jay Wilson. He's got some really good information on that if you're interested. Um, I want to encourage you to do that. But scripturally speaking, what? hey, let's, let's just simplify this. You know, a change in habits, what we got to do? We got to walk with Christ. When he comes with our free papers, he's not coming to stay there. He's coming to get us and for us to go. With, we got to go with him. We got to walk with him. We got to follow him. We got to renew our minds. Get rid of that old picture that we had as slaves. Be transformed as we see our new identity in Jesus Christ. Most of us know 2 Corinthians, let's turn there though, 2 Corinthians chapter 3. It's just worth reminding ourselves of. 2 Corinthians 3, 17 and 18. Now the Lord is the Spirit. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty, right? Freedom. The year of jubilee, release. We all with unveiled face Beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as from the Lord, the Spirit. Brother, we've been set free. Let's not, let's not be duped again. 
The next time somebody offers us something that's maybe a little, sounds a little too good to be true, don't go out to dinner with those guys and drink the wine. We don't want to end up in, slave, in chains again. Here's the bottom line. If we do not realize our freedom and become participants in it, we'll be in captivity forever. Satan ain't going to let you go. You're only going to go if you go with Jesus. Today. To Jesus says today. In Luke chapter 4, today. This scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. Today is the day of salvation. Today is the day. If you're a non-Christian, hey, you can be set free today. You know, there's a man in the congregation, Billings, who uh, died from, from cancer here a few months back. He was immersed, I think, five years ago now, here at family camp. This guy, he was free. He went to be at home with the Lord, set free from his sins. A non-Christian, that can be done today. Hey, if you're a Christian and you've been duped and you've still been obeying that old master, if you're a Christian, you can be set free today. Marshall talked about the Holy Spirit, didn't he? It doesn't stop at our immersion in Christ. The Holy Spirit, those rivers of living water, hey, the renewing by the Spirit, Today, the, the writer of Hebrews says, today if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. Today is the day of salvation, we find in Corinthians. One, one final quick point. After Solomon Northup was set free, he went back and he saw his family. And when he saw his family, man, tears just started pouring. He was so thankful to be reunited with them. Here at Jubilee, we go back to our family, right? Spiritual family. This is the, the family of God. And Solomon Northam was, you would think, hey, there's somebody, man, the rest of his life, he just spent all of his time with his family. So thankful to be, you know what Solomon Northup did? He got involved in setting other slaves free. He understood what had been granted to him. And as a realization of that freedom that he had, he was compelled, he was burned inside him to go and set others free. Guys, the year of Jubilee has been proclaimed to us. Through Jesus Christ, we are set free. Today is the day. If you believe this, and if you realize it, and if you're walking in freedom, the natural thing to do is let's be involved in the freedom movement. Let's go and set others free. Luke chapter 4. Actually, we all, we all know this. Romans 8, 37. In all these things, we're more than conquerors, right? I remember a message Jerry Hoffman preached years ago at Peaks. More than conquerors, right, Jerry? What it, what's it mean to be more than a conqueror? A liberator, right? We are more than conquerors. We are liberators. We sit, get to set other people free. Luke chapter 4. Eighteen. Through 21, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me, Jesus says, because he anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives, recovery of sight to the blind, to set free those who are downtrodden, to proclaim the favorable year of the Lord. And he closed the book, gave it back to the attendant, sat down, the eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed upon him. And he began to say to them, today, this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. Brethren, today, if you want freedom, it is available to you today. The papers are here. They're signed. They've been paid in full. Let's walk and live in freedom. Thank you.